Welcome to another episode of the program, Message of Grace. My name is Hussein. I'm very happy to be with you today and happy that you could be with us. And, uh, and uh, we have a great program for you today. And uh, before we start, let's just uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for your wonderful love and your wonderful grace and for the fact that you sent your son to die for us on the cross to, to shed his blood to forgive our sins our many sins Lord we're so undeserving of, of your salvation but you loved us so much that you sent your son to pay for our sins Lord to taste death for every man Lord we thank you Lord for that salvation thank you for the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us and we pray that today Lord the Holy Spirit will be poured out into every home uh, through the television screens like you touched me when I was 15 years old through the television screen pray you'll touch millions of hearts Lord touch the hearts of people everybody who's watching let them be blessed and those who aren't saved I pray they will be saved and those who are who need healing that they'll be touched by the Holy Spirit those who need to repent will repent Lord God and that eyes will be open and your glory will be revealed in the face of Jesus Christ amen I'm really excited today uh, for those of you who've been watching the program. By the way, I just want to say that there was a previous episode that was aired right before this program, and that one was a recorded because it was from a previous week that we did. But this program is live, and so if you would like to call, uh, you can call, on, uh, and uh, we, are, we are here right now live. And this is the new time for this program. 10 o'clock Fridays uh, before Father Zechariah's program. And I am uh, so excited because we've been doing about, we've done six episodes called No Woman Should Be a Muslim. And, uh, and we've been very blessed to have our wonderful brother Sam Shimon with us uh, on Skype. But today we have the great blessing of actually having him in person here in the studio with us. Welcome, Brother Sam. It's wonderful to have you here. It's my uh, <laughs> honor to be here, to be used of the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve you for the sake of Jesus Christ, and to serve your viewers. And I pray and I trust the Holy Spirit will fill us and Amen. anoint us Amen. to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus Christ, Hallelujah. so that every Muslim knee will bow and Hallelujah. every Muslim tongue confesses Hallelujah. that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, be glorified Amen. in this session. We need you. We love you in Jesus' name. So, Amen. thank you for having me. Yes. Well, you know, uh, I just want to review, you know, several weeks we've been doing this episode, uh, No Woman Should Be a Muslim, mm -hmm. and giving reasons why no woman should be a Muslim. And I also was thinking of changing the title to also, No Woman Should Want Her Daughter to Be a Muslim. Yeah, exactly you know, right. and uh, so, you know, we talked about what the Quran says about women. What Allah, this is Allah's words about women. Yes. We talked about the Hadith, Muhammad's words about women. And we also talk about Aisha, the six-year-old wife of Muhammad. And we also talk about sex slaves That's that right. are allowed in the Quran, 16 times referred to, Malakat al-Yameen, possessions of your right hand and the fact that that still continues and that nobody has the right to uh, prohibit what the Quran allows according right. to Moldudi. and so uh, today I want to talk about another mm -hmm. subject another reason no woman should be a Muslim and this is the story of uh, Muhammad's uh, adopted son's wife her name was Zainab. His adopted son's name was Zid. And just the, the situation that occurred between them. Maybe if you can just give us yeah. a brief overview of that story. Yeah. And hopefully by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we try to do justice to this topic, we'll look at the verses. But real quickly, <clears throat> Muhammad had adopted the slave of Khadija bint Khawailid. <clears throat> his wife. What happened was about four, five years before Muhammad supposedly became a prophet and the angel Gabriel appeared to him, Zayed's father and paternal uncle came looking for him because they had heard that he was a slave in Mecca. So they came and told Muhammad, you know, name your price to emancipate our son. We want to take him home. And Muhammad basically said, look, it's up to him. If he wants to go, he's free to go. So Zayed refused to return with his father and paternal uncle and chose to remain as a slave in Muhammad's household. Because of that gesture, the, these are all Islamic sources. These are not Jewish or Christian sources or Islamophobes, right? Yeah. Because of that gesture, it says that Muhammad took Zayed by the Kaaba and announced, I emancipate Zayed, and from now on, I take him to be my son. So from that moment on, Zayed, who was known as Zayed 
Ibn Haritha became known as Zayd Ibn Muhammad. Okay. Zayd Ibn Muhammad. Ibn so now he said, I'm going to make him my son because of that gesture, because of his love and devotion. So then what happens? After Muhammad supposedly becomes a prophet and he's in Medina, Muhammad also forces his cousin Zainab bin Jash to marry Zayd. Mm -hmm. She was hesitant at first. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about the verse that came down to saying you have no say in the matter. Mm -hmm. So she married him, and then, according to the sources, Muhammad decided to go visit Zayd. Uh -huh. Zayd wasn't there. Zainab was, <clears throat> was not fully dressed, right? Muhammad looked at her. She asked him to come in, and he refused. And as he walked away, the traditions say that she heard Muhammad, overheard Muhammad saying, Praise be to Allah who turns the hearts. Yes. So she realized he found her desirable. Mm -hmm. He started lusting for her. So when Zayd was told, that's what Muhammad said, these are the Muslim sources. This is Tabari yes. and Qurtubi, all the renowned Muslim sources, not Islamophobic literature. Zayd went to Muhammad. Now look at the love of this man for his so-called father. He went to Muhammad says, I will divorce her so that you can have her. And then Muhammad refused, saying, no, 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 keep your wife. He divorced her anyway. Yeah. And then the verses of the Quran came down telling Muhammad, that we had made her lawful to you, but you were afraid of men more so than Allah, because we're the ones who basically cause you to lust after a married woman. Now it doesn't come out and say it, but that's the implication. And then people started making fun of Muhammad. He took his son's wife. Yeah. So guess what happened? He then abolished adoption. Do not call your adopted sons uh -huh. your sons because they're not your sons. Name them after their fathers in order to save face due to this embarrassing situation. Wow. So that's a quick, quick summary right. of what Muhammad did. And hopefully we'll fill it out, flesh it out by looking yes. at the Quran and the narrations. Wow, that, that, is, that story is just unbelievable, man. When you look at all the, all the factors, all the details, all the manipulation, mm -hmm. all the... You know, all the playing that went on there and, and the actual sending down of the verse. You know, the verses that came down to Muhammad to justify his perversions. That's right. And, and, and uh, you, know, I, you, know, I would, you know, I'd like to start with, with the subject, you know, that, you know, Muhammad went to, you know, the tent he went to the tent and, you know, and he saw Zainab there. Yeah, gladly dressed. She yes. wasn't really dressed. Yeah. And then he says, oh, praise, subhan muqallib al you know, the yeah, turner of hearts. Of hearts yeah. That this was Allah who did this. Yes. Now understand what you're saying here. Yes. It was Muhammad's God mm -hmm. who caused him to lust after a married woman to commit adultery in his heart. And Lord Jesus willing, we're going to see what Jesus says about that, which mm -hmm. further proves that the Allah of the Quran is not the God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Right. Because the true God would never, would never cause someone to have adulterous, lustful desires. Mm -hmm. Lustful desires for a married woman. Now, if you want, I can look at the passage that was sent yes. out to justify. And I do this in quotations because obviously we do not believe the Quran is revelation from the true God. It um, may be revelation from yes. an unclean spirit, but not I, from the true God. I, I, right before you do that, because I want to get that, but I just want to read... Again, you know, uh, this is specifically to women who have daughters who are Muslims. I just, want to, I just want to read the English translations. The English translations, you know, this, you know, some of the things in the Quran, you know, they drive you crazy and they don't make sense. But some things hurt. It hurts when yes. you read it. And, and this is what, it's, what, what Allah said to, to Muhammad so that he could take... Uh, Zainab as, as his wife. It's, it says in the Sahih International, it says, Zaid had no more need of her, so we married her. So, so Allah is saying, Zaid had, can you imagine if your daughter, Muslim woman, if your daughter, uh, you, you get her married to this man, you allow her to marry this man, and then this man has no more need of her. Allah says he has no more need of her. Another version called, it's called the Muhsin Khan. That's right. It says, when, when Zaid accomplished his desire, so it was his desire, then he could divorce her and, 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 and give her to Muhammad. Then, this is really painful. I, I, when I read this, man, I thought, how could this be in the Quran? This is the Mustafa Khattab version. It says, when Zaid totally lost interest in her which is a butchering of what it actually says but, yeah. uh, unbelievable man and then 
and then accomplished what he would of her. Zid, and then Abdul, Abdul Halim, listen to this, when Zid no longer wanted her. And it just shows, how cold, would you, how could a woman want this for her daughter? This is in the Quran. That's right. This is in the Quran, it's not the Hadith. And this is Allah's words. When, when, when Zid no longer wanted her, you know, we gave her to you. And here, here's the th thing though, the reason why he didn't want her is because Muhammad started lusting for it's her. This, this, is not, this is not brought out because again, the Quran is, is incoherent, unintelligible, and ambiguous. This is why you have to consult sources outside of the Quran to make sense. For example, you read part of the verse, chapter 33, right. verse 37. Right. Right. But let me read it in context yes. so they understand yes. that if you don't have recourse to what I call the secondary sources, but for the Sunni Muslims, they're just as essential as the Quran itself. I'm talking about the Hadith literature and the Sirah, as well as the Mufassirin, the commentators, right? Because you right. can't make heads or tails out of much of the Quran right. without recourse to these, right. what we would call secondary sources. But for them, it's primary because right. the Quran makes no sense apart from them. Okay. But I'm going to just read the passage, and you'll get an idea of what's going on, but you won't get the full details. Okay. And then we're going to flesh it out by looking at what the Muslim scholars claim about the <laughs> reason for the revelation. And when thou said, said unto him, on whom Allah had conferred favor, thou and thou conferred favor. So you said to someone that Allah favored and you favored. Keep thy wife to thyself. So he's telling us what Muhammad told this Muhammad man. To Keep this. your wife to yourself and fear Allah. Now the question is, why did he want to leave his wife? Well, we'll flesh that out. And you did hide, here's the key, in your heart. You, Muhammad, hid uh -huh. in your heart, in your mind, that which Allah was to bring to light. Wow. And you did fear men, mankind, whereas Allah had a better right that thou should fear him. Now notice saying, you're more afraid of the people than you were of Allah, and you're hiding in your heart what uh, we're about to make manifest. So this was Allah. something s stirring up within him internally in his soul, showing how wicked and evil and immoral this man's heart was. But let's go on. It says, so when Zayd, and again, if I only had the, uh, the Quran, who's Zayd? When Zayd had performed that necessary formality from her, we gave her unto thee, unto you in marriage, so that there may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adopted sons, when the latter have performed the necessary formality from them. The commandment of Allah must be fulfilled. Now let me explain what that means. Supposedly, Allah caused Muhammad to lust after the <clears throat> wife of his son. Now they would say, well, he's an adopted son. Fine. Allah's the one who made him lust for her. Allah's the one who orchestrated events in such a way that Zayd ended up divorcing her so Muhammad could marry her because Muhammad was going to set precedence. And what was the precedence? You will be an example now, Muhammad, so that now when other adopted children divorce their wives, their adoptive fathers can then have at them and marry them. So you're going to be the example. Yes. You adoptive fathers, you can do what I did. If your adopted son yes. divorces their wives, you can marry her. Take her to your bed and have yes. sex with her because Allah is using me as an example saying it's okay. okay. Now, before I get into the problem with this, can you imagine this, brother? Here you are, you're married to someone. Now your adoptive father takes her to bed after your divorce with her. So the woman that you slept with now becomes your mother. The very woman that you took to bed, the very woman that you slept with, and you may even have children with her, now is married to your adoptive father, and now you have to see that woman as your mother. Now tell me how sick and perverted this religion is. I mean, honestly, uh, right? It's 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 almost it's almost comical. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a, there's just no other. It's like Keystone Cops. It's just unbelievable yeah. how sloppy this is. And yet here the Quran tells us, verily, this is chapter 33, okay. verse 21, about Muhammad. 33, 21. Okay. Verily, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a good example for him who looks unto Allah in the last day and remembers Allah much. So if you if you want a role model yes. to Imitate and emulate so that Allah will be pleased with you. Look no further than to Muhammad. He is your role model. And then in 68 verse 4 it says, You Muhammad are of a tremendous nature. Tremendous nature. This is why in the, in, in, in the Islamic tradition he's called Al-Insan Al-Kamil, the perfect yes, man. Perfect man. And yet here the perfect man lusts for a married woman, commits adultery in his heart, 
becomes the reason for a man to leave his, his wife, mm -hmm. takes that woman to his bed, making that woman now the adopted mother of the very one that she was married to, whom he took to, to her bed, okay. to set an example for other adoptive fathers to do likewise. Wow. This is supposedly the purest form of monotheism, the most <clears throat> righteous, the most sublime, the most perfect expression of the Abrahamic ethical monotheism, because they claim that Muhammad perfects the religion of all the prophets that came before him, yeah. starting with Abraham, even though they'll say it's Adam. Uh -huh. Actually, in the Quran, it says that this religion is the religion of Abraham, right. and he named you Muslims both before and now. Mm. Wow. And so God, Abraham's God yes. sends down a revelation that causes a man to commit adultery and then marries his adopted son's wife to set a precedence for others to follow. Wow. Now it's going to get worse. Yeah. But I, before I continue, I just read yeah. Oh, that's one thing I want to say, you know, is that we also have to remember, this is Allah's words. Eternal, uncreated. On the preserved tablet, on the loh al mahfud that's from right. eternity, yes, these uncreated. words was God's intention that Muhammad have this lust in his heart, uh, uh, marry the, the wife of his adopted son. This was all orchestrated from eternity past. That's right. Now, it's going to get worse now, my brother. Here's how it's going to get worse. Remember, it's supposedly, this was an example for other adoptive fathers right. to follow suit if they wanted to marry the divorced it's wives of their adopted such an important son. issue. It was so important that this, these commands it's existed in eternity, eternity before creation. Yes. So Allah had nothing better to do but to imagine a situation in which he was going to create Muhammad, create Zayd, create Zainab, and, and cause Zayd to marry Zainab against Zainab's uh, uh, will, because that's actually in chapter 33, verse 36, and then make Muhammad lust for his, you know, his daughter-in-law, basically, yes. even though they'll say, well, it wasn't really his son, and then making Zayd divorce her so that he can have at her. So Allah busied himself in eternity before creation with all of that scenario, yes. because I guess he had nothing better to do. And, and don't forget Aisha, what Aisha did, because she had a role in this too when Muhammad had the seizure on her floor, you know, and next to yeah. her bed to get the revelation. So, yeah. but anyway, continue. Now, 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 here's what it gets even worse. Right after this, Allah abolishes adoption. Now understand why Muhammad All married All that him. trouble and preserved tablet... <laughs> So in eternity, not only did Allah concoct a scenario where Muhammad would lust for a married woman and marry his, uh, the divorced wife of his adopted son, he also concocted the ab abolishment of adoption. All now, the yeah, all in eternity, before creation, before these characters were created, before they existed, in eternity. So Allah's like, okay, you know what? Since I have nothing better to do because I'm all alone, it's not a triune God where Father, Son, and yeah. Spirit loved and adored each other yes. before creation. Allah's all alone, so he's got to you know, entertain himself, right? So he's thinking, you know what? I'm going to create a situation where I'm going to cause my messenger to lust for a married woman, marry his adopted his son's, son's divorced wife, and then guess what? I'm going to abolish adoption right afterwards. But the passage said that Muhammad did this to be an example to embolden and encourage other adoptive fathers to do likewise. But then, chapter 33, verse 40 was sent down. I'm going to read the commentary, so I don't want people to think I'm making this up. Yeah. First, let me read the verse. Chapter 33, verse 40. People don't know why this was revealed. When I say revealed, not by the true God. By Satan, but not by the true God. Muhammad is not the father of any man among you. Okay. See, people don't know why this was revealed, but Ibn Kithir and others will explain. Okay. But he's the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets, and Allah is ever aware of all things. Now, chapter 33, verses 4 and 5. Let me read this. <clears throat> I'll read 5. Uh, well, no, let me read both. Pay attention to the language. Allah has not assigned unto any man two hearts within his body, nor has he made your wives, whom you declare to be your mothers, your mothers. Nor has he made those whom you claim to be your sons. Your sons. Okay. He hasn't made them your sons. Okay. This is but a saying of your mouths. You invented oh, this. Okay. But Allah has uh, said the truth and shows the way. Now notice verse 5. 33, 5, same chapter. Okay. Proclaim their real parentage. These sons that you claim to be your sons, proclaim their real parentage, who they really belong to, right? Okay. That will be more equitable in the sight of Allah, more just. And if you know not their fathers, if you don't know who their fathers are, then they are your brothers in the faith, and your clients, your freed slaves, and there is no sin for you in the mistakes that you make unintentionally, but what your heart's purpose 
Allah's ever forgiving, merciful. So notice what it says. Stop calling these adopted children your children. Okay. Name them after their parents. Real. Yeah. And if you don't know who they're, your parents, then call them your brothers or your freed slaves. But they're not your children anymore. Now wow. I'm really confused. I thought Muhammad married the divorced wife of his adopted son to embolden other adopted fathers to do likewise if their adopted sons divorce their wives. Okay. But Allah knew he was going to abolish adoption. So why have Muhammad do this when he knew shortly thereafter adoption would be abolished okay. so that Muhammad is a setting example for nobody. Oh yeah, because there are no more adopted no fathers. More, yeah. Wow. And then on top of that, it gets worse because it says, call him your brother. So that means Muhammad married his brother's wife. So even though this is supposed to alleviate the problem, the situation, it only compounds it. So Muhammad takes to bed his brother's wife. Ah, oh, but so he's not actually a, his brother. She's his mother or his sister-in-law or his daughter. -in -law. Which is it? <laughs> Which all, is it, right? All in two verses. Now, people don't know the reason why these were revealed. So let me go to Ibn Kathir. First, let me look at one hadith in particular. <clears throat> this hadith is from Sal Bukhari, volume 6, number 305 in English. Okay. You can read this online. Watch what it says. Narrated Abdullah ibn Amr or Umar. <clears throat> we used to call, not to call Zayd ibn Haritha, the freed slave of Allah's apostle. That's not what we called him. Okay. But we called him Zayd bin Muhammad. Okay. We used to call him Zayd bin Muhammad okay. till Until the Quranic verse was revealed. Wow. Chapter 33, verse 5, which wow. I read. Call them your adopted sons by the names of their fathers. That is more than just in the sight of Allah. So up until the point, we used to call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. Muhammad was his father. But then Allah revealed chapter 33, verse 5 and 40. So we stopped it. Now, Ibn Kathir gives us some juicy details. It's quite lengthy. So okay. let, let me know if we have a caller, okay. then I'll stop. But okay. here, this is again his exposition of these passages. Ibn Kathir, and again, for the non-Muslims, Ibn Kathir is considered one of the greatest oh, Muslim scholars greatest. who ever lived. Yeah. In fact, you cannot properly translate the Quran in English without consult consulting his massive commentary on the Quran, along with others like Tabari and Qurtubi, and yeah. I know I'm preaching to the choir when it comes to you know this already, okay. but for the benefit of the non-Muslims. Yeah. So when I quote Ibn Kathir, I'm not quoting any Joe Shmo. Right. I'm quoting a recognized medieval Muslim yes. authority that Muslims to this day yes. must consult to understand the context and interpretation of these Quranic passages. Now, he says, nor has he made your adopted sons your real sons. This was revealed. Why was it revealed? Concerning Zayd ibn Haritha. It was revealed ex oh, specifically for him, about his situation. About okay. <clears throat> May Allah be pleased with him. The freed servant of the Prophet. The Prophet had adopted him before prophethood and he was known as Zayd Ibn Muhammad. Wow. Allah wanted to put an end to this naming and attribution. This is a command which abrogates the state affairs that existed at the beginning of Islam. What it means is that at the beginning of Islam, adoption was permitted. This passage abrogates it. No more adoption in Islam, folks. We're going to bring out that implication of that. Yeah. When, it was, <clears throat> when it was permitted to call adopted sons after the man who adopted them. Then Allah commanded that they should be given back the names of their real fathers and states that this is more fair and just. Al-Bukhari narrated Abdullah ibn Umar said, Zayd bin Muhammad, the freed servant of the Messenger of Allah, was always called Zayd bin Muhammad until the words of the Quran were revealed. By the way, this introduced another problem. You know what the problem is? the problem of breastfeeding. Oh, this is a, yeah. Because we there was talked. a Muslim couple that had adopted, yes. <coughs> that oh, had yes. adopted Sad a him. particular yes. young man. Yes. And the young man had attained puberty. Yeah. But when the adoption was abolished, the father became uncomfortable because he thought that there may be some, some desire on the part of his former adopted son for his wife. So the wife came to Muhammad. This is in Sahih Muslim. So notice all the problems that Muhammad created by destroying adoption. So the wife came to Muhammad saying, my, my husband's uncomfortable because up until the passage came down, he was our adopted son. We're okay. But now he's not our adopted son. He lives on our home. So Muhammad says, give him your breast. <laughs> Suckle him 10 times. Yeah, now folks understand. And she said, but he has a beard, meaning he's grown. Suckle him. So folks understand but the I, genius of I just want to say that when you read 
uh, one of the virgin, one of the hadiths about that. It says that Muhammad laughed when he said <laughs> that. It says that Muhammad laughed and he said, "Suck." I know that he's a grown man. Suckle him. So you understand the genius of Allah and His Messenger. The genius. Let me break down how uh, how wise Allah and His Messenger happened to be. Allah decides in His wisdom to have Muhammad lust after his adopted son's wife, committing adultery. In order to cause Zayd to divorce her, so Muhammad can marry her, so Muhammad can be an example for others. Hey, I did it, you can do it too. If you have an adopted son who divorced his wife, have at her. Yeah. But then Muhammad started getting <clears throat> chastened and, yeah. and rebuked. How dare you? And this is in the Muslim sources. Ibn Kathir, they all say, how dare you, man, take your, uh, how your disgusting. son's wife. The verse comes out and says, oh, guess what? He's not really my son. Yeah. Stop calling him my son because adoption doesn't make anyone your child. Okay. But now it created another problem for Allah and his messenger to solve. For all the adopted sons. Uh, Muhammad, uh, messenger of God, we have a grown man living on our home that we adopted. He's now no longer our child. That means he can lust for my wife and have at her. Well, guess what? Here's the solution. Have your wife suckle him. Give her, and, and understand, this is supposedly going to cure any desire that yeah. man will have yeah. for what used to be his mother. Uh -huh. Having her, you know, Breast suckle made. her breast, and that's going to solve any desire he may have, any arousement, because they, now she becomes his foster mother. That's so holy and anointed <laughs> and wise words, I mean. And this all existed in eternity. Because the Quran is eternal, uncreated, right. all these commands, all this wisdom uh -huh. has always existed because the Quran, according to the traditional Sunni position, is uncreated. Being uncreated. Kalam Allah, the speech of Allah, it Allah. has yes. no beginning. Yes. You know, if I could just say one thing about the, because he got into the breastfeeding, and I've done several programs about that, but just that they actually made, because of this story, and I'm sure you know this, they, they made a fatwa in Egypt that you know that if a woman works with men that she has to you know because you, the, these men are seeing her you know uh, possibly without her hair covered or something that they have to suckle the, the men that work with them and they had an interview and it's, it's a woman named Hala and it was a famous show and she had the sheikh who did the fatwa and and, and, she, and the, the sheikh she got this huge newspaper article with that the women have to breastfeed their fellow employees who are men to be able to continue working with them. And she asks the sheikh, she says to the sheikh, she says, what am I supposed to do with all these drivers, these chauffeurs, and these, these men working at the cameras? The sheikh says to her, first of all, it says, he, you watch it, he laughs, just like, <laughs> like Muhammad, Muhammad laughed. Yeah. Just like Muhammad laughed. He laughs and says, you got to do what says. Shameless. This is the wisdom of Allah's messenger, friend. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Kaffir. Forgive me. Okay. You I'm a kafir. Call Allah, me a kafir. Allah, only Allah's messenger yes. knows. Who do you think you are? I'm sorry. But I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. hoping the non-Muslims, even the Muslims who have some dignity, because it says that have a the conscience. law of God is yeah. written in our hearts. Yeah. Even though we're fallen creatures tainted by sin, that law hasn't been a face. And the Holy Spirit works with our conscience to convict us. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, Muslims that are hearing this, it's convicting you yes. to see how immoral, how wicked, how mm. evil this system is. And I want the non-Muslims who are even considering Islam, or you young ladies who are being you know, swept off your feet by, by, feet a, Muslim by a Muslim man. man. Yeah. This is the true face of Islam. We're not mm -hmm. making it up. We're not lying. We're quoting their most authentic sources. This is what Muhammad did. Not only did he lust after a married woman, took his adopted son's divorced wife, he then abolished adoption. I'm going to bring down yeah, that implication that means. in a minute, but I want you to see the irony here. Here's the irony. Here's the irony. Adoption doesn't make someone your child, but breastfeeding does. Did you catch it? Because people don't understand, why did Muhammad have the woman breastfeed? Breastfe because uh -huh. then that makes you a foster son. <laughs> So breastfeeding will make you a woman's son. So now you can't marry her daughters because you're her okay. foster son. Okay. But adoption doesn't make you a child. Only the wisdom of Allah and the Messenger could come up with this. Adoption doesn't make you a child. But if a woman suckles a man, 
then that becomes her son. Okay. Okay, if I could just... Dude, you're, you're just opening so many things. I just want to say one more thing, and Please. that is that, you know, Aisha was well known, you know, that she had... I mean, they have a list of all the men that used to come to her after Muhammad died, over 140. They have every name of them, and they, they would have to be suckled before they could come see Aisha. And Aisha, when Muhammad died, there was a verse in the Quran about this, right. about uh, ten sucklings and everything. But that, by to, to five. But, you know, Allah preserves his word. Right. Chapter 15, verse 9. Allah, it's impossible that any, the, the, the gospel's been changed, the Torah's been changed, but the Quran cannot be changed. But... A goat ate that That's verse. Right. That's right. This is an so, magic. So this, this story just goes on. <laughs> yeah, and just to clarify, there was a sheet that contained, because originally it was 10 sucklings, yeah, then but five, Allah in His yeah. mercy reduced it to five. Yeah. No, you can suckle them five times. Out. That's good enough. And the sheet that contained the, the abrogation of the 10 suckling mm -hmm. was under Aisha's bed, supposedly kept in safe storage, and then a goat ate it. A goat ate so it. So that... Those passages that speak of a woman suckling a man five times to make that man her foster son have disappeared. Mm -hmm. No one has a copy of it. Those verses do not exist. And yet we're told that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, preserved. from A to Z, yes. every jot and tittle. Yeah. Except for that, but not from goats. It doesn't say coincidence. That the, it doesn't say that, the, that Allah is going to preserve it from goats. That's right. That's you know, yeah, so you're don't, don't twist. Yeah, that's right. You're don't right. twist. I'm sorry. You know, I'm a kafir. You got to forgive me. Now, just to add to the the insanity of this religion, this the grossly immoral and irrationality of this religion. Here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. Zainab, according to the Muslim sources, didn't want to marry Zayd. Muhammad said because Zainab is Muhammad's cousin, and Muhammad said. I want you to marry Zayd. She objected. She didn't want to marry Zayd. So then guess what Allah did? He sent down a verse saying, you have no say in the marriage. So let me read. And this is ironically okay. the verse before chapter 3337. Okay. 3337 is where we're told that Muhammad lusted for Zayd's wife. Okay. Okay. But now 3336. <clears throat> and it becomes not a believing man or a believing woman. When Allah and his messenger have decided an affair for them. Now notice, it doesn't just say Allah. And Lord willing, oh, maybe in the messenger, future, you yes. should do some programs on the deification of Muhammad. Yes, maybe, that, you, maybe you can come do it with oh, me. Oh, I would so. love to. Yes. I would love to, because even though Muslims will tell you Muhammad is a man, no more, no, no less. No way. And Islam is the religion of submitting to Allah. Yeah, no, on the contrary, if you carefully read the Quran and the Hadith, Muhammad has been elevated to a divine status that rivals his God, because Allah does nothing apart from Muhammad. Yeah. Here, notice it says, when Allah, Allah and his messenger, not what Allah has decided, Allah and his messenger have decided, right. yeah. then they should, after that, claim any say in the affair. In other words, when Allah and Muhammad decide something, you have no say so. So what did Allah do to silence Zainab because you don't want to marry Zayd? Hey, you have no say in the matter. Allah and, and his, messenger. his messenger, my messenger and I have decided you marry him. Now hold on. This too is an eternal verse. So in eternity, Allah knew that he was going to force Zainab to, to marry Zayd. Then Allah knew he was going to make Muhammad lust for a married woman, committing adultery in his heart. Then Allah knew that was going to make Zayd divorce Zainab so that Muhammad could take her to his bed, making her now the mother of Zayd, a woman whom he saw naked and took to bed, now is my mother, and I got to treat her as my mother. Then Allah knew that because people are going to make fun of Muhammad for stealing his son's wife, he's going to abolish adoption. And then Allah knew that because of that, People are going to be uncomfortable because now they have grown men in their homes who are no longer their children. So then Allah knew he was going to make women, grown women, suckle grown men to make them foster sons. Allah knew all this in eternity because Allah had nothing better to do. He was bored. And so he, he sent a verse down. And it, Allah knew also that the goat was going to eat the verse. Yes. You know, so that it, it no longer is in the Quran, even though it's still in all the other books. You yeah, know? And, and this is the wonderful religion of Islam. This is the supposedly the perfection, the completion uh, of the monotheism proclaimed by Abraham. Yeah. And he's supposedly the God of Abraham, yeah. this God who sent down the Quran. Yeah. Now I'm hoping people see just how wicked... How evil, how immoral, how irrational Islam truly is. And we didn't make up anything. I'm quoting the Quran, Ibn the Kathir. Hadith, like Bukhari. Ibn Kathir, I can bring Tabari, Qurtubi, renowned Muslim authorities. So Muslims, if you have a problem, 
Don't take it up with me or him. Mm -hmm. Take it up with your Muslim sources, your yeah. Muslim authorities. That's what Father Zechariah always says. He says, hey, if you have a problem with it, these are your books. Burn them. Yeah. Do what the earth men did. Just burn yes, them. destroy them. Come to Jesus, yes. the, the only true God and eternal life, yes. the eternal love of the Father. Now, let's bring out what I would consider the heartbreaking implications of the abolishment yeah. of adoption. Yes. We'll contrast that to the true God. But you understand the implication when Muhammad abolished adoption. And I, I pray that the people listening, if not now, even later when they go back, I pray by the Spirit this will now break your heart for the Muslims who have been taken captive by this wicked antichrist system. Because Muhammad abolished adoption, that means barren women can never have children mm. because they can't adopt. Because. That means couples who because no fault of their own, own can't sire children will live childless because Allah and his messenger have forbidden them from taking anyone <laughs> that's not their son and calling him, or even, her, it's not just sons, it also applies to daughters. Mm -hmm. In other words, parents who can't have children, if they're Muslim, can never adopt children and call them their own. Now, it gets even worse. What about the orphan children in mm -hmm. Muslim lands? You have a young boy who's been orphaned. Let's say there's a war, something happens, parents did. Or a young girl, orphaned, mm -hmm. because of Allah and his messenger. That young boy, and I pray it breaks your heart, because I'm, not, I'm talking about reality here. So this we're not talking theoretical. Yeah. We're talking about a religion the... that's impacting millions of lives and destroying millions of lives and making millions of lives miserable. Yeah, you're making the parents' lives miserable and these orphans' lives orphans. miserable. Orphan children, yeah. young boys, young girls, can never be adopted, so they can never call anyone father or mother. See, it, it moves me in a spirit that I want to cry because yeah. in contrast to the God of the Bible. Now let's see the God, the true God, the true God revealed in Jesus. Yeah. Our God loves adoption. Mm -hmm. Here, let me read it. Romans 8, 14 and 17. This. Romans 8, 14. Now I want you to see the difference between Jesus, mm -hmm. the God and judge of Muhammad, and what Muhammad's God did. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, speaking through his servant, the Apostle Paul. For as many as are led by the Spirit, Romans 8, 14, 18. As many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Amen. <laughs> Our God loves adoption. He loves to adopt you and make you his son and daughter. Come to Jesus. Let me finish it. Spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, here's the thing. Not only did Muhammad abolish adoption, but Allah himself does not like to be called anyone's father, yes. and he doesn't like anyone to be called his children. Well, but I'm here it says, here it says, here it says, when God sends the Spirit and makes you a child, He now gives the authority that you can look to God, uh -huh. and from your heart, and know it's true, because He loves and adores you. You are my daddy, because yeah. the word Abba, it's an Aramaic he, expression like that Abba. means more than simply father. It means daddy. So you can, because uh, of Jesus, call him daddy. because of the spirit of Christ, because God sent his son, yeah. you can look to the father and say, you truly are my daddy. Hallelujah. You are my father. Hallelujah. You are my, my Abba. You are Hallelujah. my daddy because of Jesus. Yeah. And just if, to, go if ahead. I, I wanted to say, you know, when I became, when I got saved, you know, because I was a Muslim. As a Muslim, I used to have to memorize the Quran. And when I became a Christian, I started memorizing the Bible. And I just want to say the passage, one of the most important passages that I memorized was Galatians 4, 1 through 6. That's what I was about to read. Yeah, go ahead. But I want to say how I memorized it. I felt the Holy Ghost led me. It says, I just want to say it, and I want Amen. people out there to do this. It says, now I say, this is the passage, now I say that an heir, as long as he's a child, he differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time pointed of the father. Even so, sin, when he was a child, was in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem sin, who was under the law, that the sin might receive the adoption of a son. And because a sin is a son, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into a sin's heart, crying, Abba, Father. So a sin is no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I think everybody should memorize that. It gives you a new identity as a Christian. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because for me, that, that was such a powerful revelation in my life. 
that God be, is my father and that I'm a son of God. And that's because adoption. of the spirit of his eternal son. Because Hallelujah. remember that passage as he said, he sent the spirit of his son. Yes. Because Jesus is the essential son of God, the eternal son of God. Hallelujah. The son who's always existed Hallelujah. in the love of the father and the son and the spirit. They now want to extend that sonship to us. The In most fact, precious thing, yes. and Satan wants to steal that most precious thing. And, and I, I like what you said. It is Satan who destroys, yes. who steals, who murders, yes. murders your joy, murders <clears throat> your said. happiness, and destroys families. Yes. It is the true God that creates families. In fact, here it says in Ephesians 3, 14 to 15. God, if you actually read Genesis, the first institution that God created was the family unit. He created male and female right. and said, be fruitful, multiply, said, the earth. Why would God, why would, why would the true God, why would the true God create families on earth? Because here you go. For this reason, I bow my knee to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Meaning because God is a father by nature uh -huh. and he is the father of Jesus Hallelujah. eternally. Mm -hmm. He is a father who delights in creating families. Mm. So he created a heavenly family and an earthly family Hallelujah. because the one God is the father and he's the eternal father of the eternal son. Hallelujah. And he now extends that filial relationship to his creation. Yeah. He wants sons and daughters. He doesn't just want servants. Allah, all he wants, Allah only wants is slaves. In right. fact, according to chapter 19 of the Quran, verses 88 to 93, chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. It says that the highest relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master slave, relationship. Yeah. That's it. Yes. A slave to master relationship. But according to the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, if you read 30 to 36, it says that <clears throat> if you're a slave, a slave does not abide in the house of, forever. Yes. But if you're a son, yes. you abide forever. forever. And if the son sets, sets you, free you free from your slavery, you'll be free indeed Hallelujah. and become a child of God. Hallelujah. So the heart of God yeah. revealed to Jesus, he doesn't want slaves, he wants sons Children. and daughters. Amen. And Jesus wants brothers and sisters, Hallelujah. born of his spirit, sealed Hallelujah. by his spirit, so that you can Amen. be part of God's forever family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, you know, I'll say this for... I mean, really, you know, this was such a revelation to me, you know, because I, I thought, you know, when I became a Christian, I thought that I changed my religion. And, and, and I, I had so much fear in my heart when I when I felt that way. But one day the Holy Ghost revealed to me out of the Bible that I had become a son of God. Hallelujah. That was the most precious revelation. Forty years ago it happened to this day. It's the most precious thing is to know that I am a child of God. And, and, and you know, the, and you're part of God's forever family. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, to make it, if it couldn't get in any more disgusting and troubling and depressing, how that just this religion, how evil and irrational it is, I, I, I kept hammering the point. It was Allah who caused Muhammad to lust. to lust for a married woman. It was Allah who created adultery in the heart of His messenger and caused him to to carry that lustful, adulterous inclination to act upon it now some will say well you know what that's your perversion of the Quran you're twisting the Quran because you're a Christian and you're an Islamophobe okay let me read the words of Muhammad okay. attributed to Muhammad in Sahil Bukhari and Sahih Muslim do you get any more higher than Sahil Bukhari Those, Sahih Muslim? that's the number what two and number three books of Islam after the Quran, the Quran right? Sahih Bukhari then Sahih Muslim if you're a Sunni Muslim yeah. now am I simply being Islamophobic because I'm saying that because Allah... Because you're reading the books. Yeah, because Allah <laughs> is the one who made Muhammad have adulterous desires, that Allah creates adultery, makes people have adulterous, lustful desires, showing he's a wicked God who's not really God, but actually Satan masquerading as God. Is that my view or is that Muhammad's view? Well, let me read Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim, book 33, number 6421. <clears throat> Verily, Sahih Muslim, book 33, number 6421. Verily, Allah has fixed, pay attention to this, mm -hmm. wow, Allah has decreed, has written, has fixed the very portion of adultery which a man will indulge in and which he of necessity must commit. My goodness. Oh my gosh. Did you read that? Oh, say it again. Okay. Say it again. And I'm going to read Bukhari's version too. Okay. Oh my gosh. This is Sahih Muslim, okay. book 33. Number 6421 in the English, and it's online, folks. Google it. Sahih Muslims online. You don't need to go to the Muslim bookstore and buy it or Amazon. Wow. 
verily, truly, have no doubt, yeah. Allah has fixed the very portion of adultery wow. which a man will indulge in wow. and which he of necessity must commit. Lord Can Jesus. you escape it? Lord Jesus. Have mercy. It reminds me of in the Quran when it talks you know, about the names of Allah that you know one of the things that it says about him is he incites people to corruption. He incites people to lewdness yeah. and immorality. This is one Chapter of his names. Chapter 17, verse 16 of the Quran. Yeah. I mean... And I'm going to read that in a minute because that's an interesting one because it tells you that when Allah wants to destroy someone, He makes them commit right. lewdness and sin. Lewdness. So He has a pretext to condemn yes. them. I'll read that. But let me read Bukhari. This is a little longer. Sal Bukhari. This is English. You can find online. Wow. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, number 609. Sal Bukhari, volume 8, number 609. Narrated Ibn Abbas. For those of you who don't know who Ibn Abbas is, he's Muhammad's first cousin, considered one of the greatest Muslim scholars who ever lived. A Sahabi who knew Muhammad. Muhammad loved him. And Muhammad actually prayed that Allah would give him wisdom in the deen. So if there's anyone who knows Islam, it's Ibn Abbas, right? Mm -hmm. I did not see anything so resembling minor sins as what Abu Huraira said from the Prophet who said, now he's quoting another companion, Allah has written, meaning predestined, <laughs> for the son of Adam, his inevitable, I mean you can't avoid it, share of adultery, whether he's aware of it or not. The adultery of the eye, see Allah has even determined you're going to lust with your eye, is the looking at something which is sinful to look at. The adultery of the tongue is to utter what is unlawful to utter, enticing let's say a woman or a man, right? And inner self, your inner heart, your soul, wishes and longs for adultery, and the private parts turn that into reality or refrain from submitting to the temptation. In other words, Allah will make you have adulterous looks, adulterous words, using you know words to entice someone to commit adultery, and desire adultery, and then He has determined whether you're going to act upon it and commit adultery or refrain from it. It's all in the power of Allah, the Qadr of Allah. It's all in the power of Allah. So, in other words, Allah has said, you know what? You're going to now lust for that married woman. You're going to now entice her Talk with your tongue. Her. Yeah. You're going to want to have her. And your private parts are going to be in a... <laughs> and, and now I can either say, that's as far as you go, or you know what? Go all the way. Defile her and commit adultery. That's up to me. It's up to my kadr. Uh, you know, one thing that I know, you know, from my having lived in the Middle East, is quite often there's this fatalistic thing yes. in Islam, where, and they always... That, that exact word that you, you said from Sahih al-Bukhari is that they say maktub. It's written. It's written. And that's exactly what that just says. It's like you can't avoid it. It's, it's your fate. You have to do it. Your destiny is to do this thing. Now let me ask you a question because we're going to look at another passage. The true God of the Bible is beyond mm -hmm. sin. Too holy, too pure. I can give you references. Yes, Micah chapter 3 verse 4. Habakkuk or Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Psalm 66 verse 18. Psalm chapter 5 verses 4 to 7. Our God is absolutely pure, holy, undefiled, and He's above and beyond causing anyone to commit heinous, immoral acts or have immoral inclinations. Because our God is purity and holiness. He That's James 1.13. James, right. Yeah, yeah James 1.13. When you're tempted, do not say God, God tempted, tempted you because God cannot be tempted by evil and tempts no one with evil. So God is above and beyond that. Now, Allah takes pride in causing you to commit adultery yeah. it's and his causing name. you to commit immorality. It's his name. Doesn't that sound, that, uh, sound more like the devil than the true God revealed in Jesus Christ? <laughs> That's a father Zechariah says. He said, the, Allah does this and, and in the Quran. Allah incites to evil, and so Sa does yeah. Satan. They yes. So, in other words, this Allah of Muhammad sounds more like the devil mm -hmm. condemned in the Holy Bible, who poses all that is true, all that is righteous, all that is pure, and wants to mislead mankind from the absolute purity and holiness that God desires us to pursue and possess by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus. So in other words, Allah of the Quran yes. is none other than the devil condemned in the Holy Bible. And further proof of it is, and you know this, this the is in chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 54, yes. chapter 8, verse 30, 
One of the names of Allah is Khairul Makarim. What does that mean? Khairul Makarim. The best of deceivers. Yet according to Revelation 12, 9, it is the devil who deceives the world. And in John chapter 8, verse 44, the devil is the father of lies and a murderer. And yet the Quran says Allah is the greatest deceiver. He even makes Shaitan Iblis look mild in comparison. In other words, the Allah of the Quran is none other than the devil condemned in the Satan. Bible, the devil masquerading as God to deceive Muhammad and others who follow suit. Now, you mentioned that Allah is the one who incites people to commit lewdness. Yeah. Chapter 17, verse 16 of the Quran. See, when we say something, we try to document it. Yes. We try to go to the sources and handle them accurately because we don't want to miss quote, yeah, misinterpret yeah. even what Islam says because Islam has enough evil and irrationality to refute itself and destroy itself. So we don't need to make up yeah, stuff. Yeah. 17 verse 16. And when we, this is supposedly Allah speaking, when we would destroy a township, when we wanted to get rid of a town, we wanted to destroy all its inhabitants, the men, the women, the children, the infants, the animals. When we would destroy a township, we send commandment to its folk who live at ease, and afterward, they commit lewdness, abomination. Did you catch it? When Allah wants to destroy a specific town, He sends command, you guys living in leisure, start sinning. Start committing lewdness. So start acting immorally, so now I can have a reason to destroy you. So they commit abomination therein, and so the word does have the effect, meaning the decree, what I've decreed, will be fulfilled, and we annihilate it with complete annihilation. How do you explain this? Allah is merciful and compassionate. And, you know, it's, <laughs> this is just another aspect of his, uh, you know, it so just blows your mind, you know. Now, if you're not convinced this sounds like Satan rather than the true God, I don't know what will convince you. And that's my prayer by the yeah. Holy Spirit that yeah. you'll be convicted. Now, let me quote the words of Jesus because I know our time yes. is upon us. Yes. Let me quote the words of Jesus that Jesus condemns not only Muhammad, but Muhammad's God yes. to hell. Because what does our Lord Jesus say? Matthew 5, 27, 28. The words of the true God in the flesh, the eternal Son, the eternal Word, the very heart of the Father, revealed to mankind. Here's what our Lord says. Matthew 5, 27, 28. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said by the ancients, <clears throat> you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, we read chapter 33, verse 36, yeah. and you also mentioned what Muhammad said. When Muhammad saw Zainab and turned, what did he say? He says, Subhanallah, Muqallib al you know, the turner of hearts. So Allah, Muhammad is saying, Allah has now turned Praise my heart Allah, yes. to lust for this married woman, yeah. to desire this married woman to want to have sex with her. Jesus says that... Muhammad and his God are condemned to hell because Allah is the one who made Muhammad adulterer at heart. Because Jesus says, if you lust for a woman at heart, you're an adulterer. And, but who made Muhammad lust? Allah. Allah did. The true God revealed in Jesus would never do that. Mm. Now let's read what happens when Muhammad then caused the divorce because Allah made him lust for a married woman and then married her. Th these are the words of the true God. Yeah. Matthew 5, 31, 32. It was said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, sexual morality, and neither Zayd nor Zainab were unfaithful, right? Yeah. There was no infidelity, right? No. So they had no legitimate grounds for divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for this reason, marital unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries her is the, who is divorced commits adultery. So Zayd caused Zainab to be an adulteress, but it was Allah who made him do that. Yes. And then when Muhammad married her, he became an adulterer. That means from the teachings of Jesus, Allah, Muhammad, Zayd, Zainab are condemned to hell for being adulterers and adulteresses. Wow. All that's from the Sermon on the Mount. Yep. Matthew 5, 27, 28. Wow. And Matthew 5, 31, 32. I didn't make it up, brother. Wow. 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 That is just... Uh, you really blew my mind, especially because with God blows people's minds, right? Especially with these verses about from Sahih Muslim, Sahih Al Bukhari, there about that Allah has written the amount yes. of adultery you're going. And I just want to say, you know, I've I, I've been laughing, I've been laughing at a lot. Uh, you know, and it's almost intentional that I'm doing it because I want Muslims to know that people are laughing, people are laughing at this this unbelievable teaching of Islam. 
We're not laughing at you. We're, we're laughing at this, the, this, the yes. insanity of this book, the insanity of this religion. You know, we love you. Amen. We want you to be free. And, and you know what? Like I was saying at the beginning, some of the things in the Quran, you just, you just say, unbelievable. You, you laugh at But some of it breaks your heart. And we talked about so many things today that just break your heart. And, and for women... You know, the, the name of this, this program is No Woman Should Be a Muslim. It's also No Woman Should Want Her Daughter to Be a Muslim. Yeah, how can you want this for your daughter? How can you want this for your children? You know, these things that Muhammad did to justify his lust, all of it started with the lust in his heart. And look what it has done to the most millions, millions, billions of lives in history have been destroyed because of this. That's not the true God. It's not the true God of love. And we're just, we're just, we want you to come to open your hearts to see the true God of love who came, who so loved you that he gave his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. Sam, you know, we're, we're, yeah. we're kind of coming close to the end. You know, I just, uh, yeah. I know that, you know, I'm saying, I know how this, this issue has really touched your heart and I just pray that, Maybe you would like to go ahead and close us. Uh, if you can go ahead and just uh, give us a closing statement. Yes, I, I just want to emphasize, even though we've been making fun of how irrational and evil this religion is, let me bring out again to just reiterate what he said, the practical implications of this wicked religion. Right now as we speak, right now as we speak, throughout the 1400 years of Islam's existence, millions of couples have died without being able to hold a young child in their hands and say, this is my son, this is my daughter, because of Muhammad's lust for a married man, and then destroying adoption to save face. Millions and millions of orphans, even to this day, orphans in Muslim world, will never, never be able to look to someone and say, Baba, Daddy, or Mommy, Yimmi. They can never say it. See, I'm being moved in my spirit <clears throat> because of this evil religion. You know, so... We need to pray for the Muslims. The Muslims are not our enemies. They are victims taken captive victims, by the enemy. Yeah. They need to know the heart of a God who says, I love you so much. I want you to be my sons and daughters through faith in my son, born of the spirit. Folks, pray for these Muslims, especially for the barren couples and the orphans who will never ever be able to have a family because of this wicked man and his wicked God. May the Lord Jesus erase his memory from the earth and may the Lord Jesus shine his love upon all Muslims and bring them to himself. The God who loves you and adores you to the point he died for you and now he lives to call you to himself and to intercede for you. That is the God that loves you. That is the God worthy of your worship. Thank you so much, Sam. And it's such a such a wonderful pleasure and honor to have you with us actually in the flesh here <laughs> in the studio you know it uh you know we've been this this series of episodes has just been so wonderful with uh your knowledge your great wisdom in this subject and uh, and thank you to all of you who who are, have been with us and who've been watching and uh we love you here at Kanat al fadi and uh and we just pray for you and uh, we hope that you will also be with us in a future episode of this program, Message of Grace.